Hey guys, Will here. So today in front of us, we have the brand new Fnatic CSL Universal Hub. So a lot of you guys will be familiar with the Club Sport Universal Hub, which we have installed on this flat two wheel here in front of us. That product has been around for a number of years now, but it's good to have something hitting the market that comes in at quite a significantly lower price point. So this is gonna be $149.95 US or the same in euros. Not sure 100% on Australian pricing just yet, but I'll let you guys know down in the comments once that is announced. Uh, the Universal Hub, the Club Sport Universal Hub came in at $349.95 US, so quite a lot cheaper. And from what I can see from looking at the spec sheets and everything so far, it seems to have quite a decent feature set. So we're going to get it unboxed today. We're going to take you through all the features of this new hub. And then we're going to try it out with a bunch of different wheels, both from Fnatic as well as Aftermarket to see just how versatile this hub is. So let's get started. All right, let's get into this guy. So it says, being second. Sucks. <laughs> it does suck. <laughs> is to be the first. Oh, that's harsh. Of the ones who lose. <laughs> Ouch, that's, wow. <laughs> Brutal. So, all right, let's just quickly grab the bits and pieces out of here. There's not too much to go through here, so we'll just get the box out of the way, grab the tools out that are included too. Everything's well packaged as we would expect. Nice little foam insert there. Relatively small box as well. Let's get into this thing. So, grab it out of the bag here. Okay, this it's got, actually got a really nice feel to it. It's I mean, it's plastic, but it's a decent quality plastic, just as a very, very first impression. I kind of, you know, being a CSL Elite class product, I wasn't, you know, 100% sure what to expect, but first impression is it's the same basic quality in terms of the plastics and the buttons and everything that they've used as the button module endurance that we have on the Porsche 911 GT 3R wheel and also on our R300 wheel sitting over here as well. So that's actually really impressive as a, just as a very first impression, you can see the little nut certs where we've got the 50 mil stud pattern for 50 millimeter wheels as well as or 50 millimeter mounting wheels as well as 70 millimeter so we've got a little screwdrivery tool thing here which is actually an allen key head we've got a little nut driver thing too a little spanner and then we've got our standard quick start guide here as well as some fanatic stickers so our usual sticker sheet. Then we've also got our standard quick sight guide here as well. So the usual information that we would expect to see, package contents, uh, the data port C, wheel compatibility, and you know, all the information, you guys don't need to go through all of that now, but you know, as we expect from Fnatic now, all the information that you need is all covered in that. Now, just before we get started on having a closer look at this, one thing I did notice is that there's no bolts for actually mounting a wheel included in the kit with the Universal Hub. Now, just having a quick look through the quick start guide here, it says choose M5 bolts with a maximum thread length of 12 millimeters. Fanatic wheel rims are supplied with the correct bolts. And that's been our experience as well. Whenever we've bought a wheel uh, that has been just the wheel on its own without any sort of a mount, it has always come with the required bolts for mounting it to either the Universal Hub, uh, the Club Sport one, or you know whatever other hub that you're mounting it to. So if you are going to be looking at mounting an aftermarket wheel to this hub, just make sure that you do keep in mind you will need some M5 bolts. All right, so before we get started on this, I should just talk a little bit more about compatibility. So compatibility for Xbox, as we know, comes from a chip inside the wheel or the hub in this case. So doesn't have that chip inside it, not Xbox compatible. So we do have PC compatibility though, as well as PlayStation. So presu presuming that you have a PlayStation compatible base, this will work with your PlayStation. It is game dependent in terms of the feature set though so just check with the game that you're playing uh, Fnatic will have information on their website around that too so just check that as well don't assume that all the functions that you see in this video will all function in every single game on PlayStation but look in terms of the construction I did actually just notice one little small difference between this and the button module endurance I commented at the start that it seemed like it was very similar quality plastic the um, button module endurance if we just have a closer look at that it does have a sort of a rubberized finish on the plastic, which this doesn't have. So it is a different plastic that they've used. Similar in terms of the overall quality though, I would say. So just wanted to mention that as well, just because I didn't want that to be misleading. It isn't exactly the same plastic as, uh, as the button module endurance, but 
So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight standard push buttons. We've got two toggle switches, so two way toggle switches there, as well as another rocker switch here, so we can push left or right. And then we've obviously got our paddles as well, which we'll have a look at in more detail in just a moment. Now, one difference between these toggle switches and the ones that you would find on a podium spec device is these ones, as you can see, have these little dust jackets on them. They appear to be the same length in terms of how far the stem actually pokes out from the base, but yeah, these ones have this little dust jacket on them. So again, for, for sim racing, it doesn't really matter. I don't really see that having an impact on performance. Now, they don't feel absolutely identical to each other, but I wouldn't say that the button module endurance feels better. It's just a little bit different. This has got kind of a more, maybe a little bit more of a, of a defined click to it, but definitely not something that you're gonna kind of wish you had every single time you were driving or anything like that. So I'd say, you know, for what they are, they're absolutely fine. One thing I would mention with these though, is that they do stick out quite a long way from the faceplate itself. So um, when you're doing rally or drifting in particular, if you're using a wheel that doesn't have any dish on it and your hands are kind of slipping past, you will need to be a little bit careful that these don't catch on your hands as the thing's spinning past you because I can see those snapping off or getting damaged quite easily if it was kind of slipping past your hands and getting caught up in that manner. But hopefully that won't be a problem for anybody, but just one thing that I do think needs consideration there if you're not using a dished wheel, for example. So moving on from that, we've got our three digit seven segment display as well. So that is used for or various different telemetry data. We'll take a look at telemetry in just a moment when we get up and running on the PC, as well as for accessing our tuning menu. And you can see there's a little button there for accessing the tuning menu. And then I'll show you how all that works once we're up and running on the sim as well. But in terms of the feel of the buttons, I'm not gonna spend a whole bunch of time on this. They're the uh, same snap dome buttons that we're used to from say the button module endurance, for example. They've got a nice feel to them, a nice tactile click, a nice defined intentional press to them and yeah, I mean really nothing to complain about at all there. I thought, you know, being a CSL Elite wheel, they might feel a little bit on the cheap side, but that doesn't seem to be the case at all. The funky switch feels really nice as well. Nice defined detents for each one of the uh, clicks as you rotate it around as well. So you shouldn't have any problems knocking that or rotating it by accident, but we'll comment on that again, obviously once we go for a drive. But yeah, look, I mean, so far, everything seems to be really good quality and particularly for the price point, see no issues at all. One other thing I will mention as well, we've got this little area of raised plastic around one of the buttons too, and that's gonna help us for uh, feeling when we're driving in VR so we can kind of get a feel for where our hands are on the wheel without being able to physically see it. So let's just quickly chat about this little port on the top here. Now, for those of you with a keen eye, you would see that that is our standard USB-C type connection, but it's important to point out that this doesn't mean that you can just connect any USB-C device to this and it will interface through the wheel to your PC. So you're not gonna be able to connect, say, an aftermarket wheel that has its own buttons to this and then use it through the PC. This is what Fnatic call a data port C, and this is for connecting their own peripherals. It runs their own protocol. So say, for example, the button module endurance, that uses the same style connection. Now, I don't know at the time of release least whether or not this will support the button module endurance. I can't really imagine why anybody would want to mount a button module on top of another button module anyway. So it's kind of a little bit redundant there. I haven't seen any other accessories yet from Fnatic that utilize this, but I'm assuming that this is something that they're gonna bring in moving forward for various different bits and pieces. So that's what that's for. Just don't get confused and think that you can connect your own peripherals to that port. It is only for their own peripherals through their own protocol. So let's talk a little bit more about the shifters now, and then we'll move on to the quick release. So the same kind of honeycomb design here that we saw with the McLaren V2 GT3 wheel recently. So that's kind of adding a little bit more reinforcement there. They've got a nice click to them. Now in terms of rigidity there, they do have a little bit of twist in them. You can see if I hold it down flat on the desk, just so it's not moving around. Bit of twist there. And I don't want to understate it. I'm showing you guys because it is what it is. And another thing where we're just talking about quality as well, as you can see, we do have these little metal nut certs on the front plate here as well. So we are screwing into metal when we tighten down our wheel. So we shouldn't have any problems with things working their way loose or uh, flexing about too much once we get up and running. So let's talk a little bit more about the quick release now, and then we'll move on to the adjustability of the paddles as well as the buttons. So this is the same 
new generation, I guess, redesigned quick release system that we've seen on the McLaren GT3 V2 wheel recently, as well as the WRC rally wheel a few months back. So it's a glass injected plastic, which does make it a little bit more solid than just a standard plastic like we see on the rest of the hub. Now, one thing that we have seen come up in quite a few comments on the previous videos that we've done on those other wheels with the trick release is talking about the amount of flex that's in it. Now, what I found is that the flex primarily comes from where the mount actually mounts to the wheel itself on those other wheels that we reviewed, but we'll definitely have a look at that in more detail once we get up and running on this wheel. Whereas with the older style metal quick release system, which is replaceable as an optional accessory on this, should you wish to do that, um, the, the flex tends to come from the actual shaft and where it mounts onto the base itself. So there's a little bit of play in here. With this system that actually clamps down onto the onto the wheelbase or the wheel shaft itself or the wheelbase shaft you don't tend to get the flex in that in that part of the assembly it comes more from the back part here but again we'll talk about that in just a moment but the way this works if we take the little sticker off the back that gives us a warning about over tightening basically what happens is you slide the wheel onto the wheelbase you turn the little collar around tighten it down and that grips it into position so you can see there's these little plastic fingers here that are actually squeezed down when we rotate the collar so we've got a little marking there that shows unlock and locked position, and it's important to not over tighten this. But what we do is we slide it onto the base, we rotate this around, and we don't go further than the little line that's marked there. So if we're completely covering the line, that should be the limit. And as we do that, not only do the little fingers kind of squeeze on and hold it snugly in place on the shaft, but we've also got that little ball bearing there as well that sort of acts as a retainer and squishes in as well. So when we loosen that off, the ball bearing's loose, and you can see that push down. When we rotate the collar, you can see that pushes up and holds it in position. So look, I actually really like this design. And as I've mentioned in the previous videos, I do hope that we see a similar design carry forward to replace the metal quick release later on, because there is that little bit of shaft play, uh, as I call it, in that metal quick release inherently in the design. And it does depend on manufacturing tolerances. Some people's bases, it does it more than others. Some wheels will do it more than others, just depending on how this is machined. But yeah, whenever you have two metal parts that are sliding together, there's always gonna be a little bit of tolerance in there between the two to allow it to actually slide on. And you know, any variation in that amount of tolerance, because there's nothing really other than the metal ball bearings in there to take up that slack, there's always gonna be that little bit of play. Whereas with this, because you've got an adjustable tightness here, you can actually crank that down to to, uh, you know, adjust for whatever manufacturing tolerances there is in the shaft itself. So that actually works really well. So yeah, I think now it's time to move on to the adjustability of the buttons and the shifters themselves. And then we can get a couple of different wheels mounted up and uh, talk about ergonomics because I think that, you know, there's at least in theory with the, with the different stud patterns here, we've got the 50 mil and the 70 mil. So we should be able to mount a wide variety of different wheels. It does also mention in the marketing materials as well that it's compatible with, uh, with dish style wheels as well for rally driving or uh, drifting. So we'll test that out too. And uh, yeah, then we can go for a drive. So with the provided tool, we loosen off the nylock nuts along the bottom here. So one, we don't take them off com completely. We would take them off completely to switch over to the metal quick release, of course, but we're not doing that right now. So we've loosened off one, two, three, four. And then with the included little screwdriver Allen key tool, we're gonna loosen off this guy, this guy, and this guy. And once that's done, and again, we don't wanna remove these entirely, just loosen them off. And now, there we go, oh, that's cool. And they actually, it's really clever. They move in unison together as well so you don't end up misaligning them. So just hold that up to the camera for you guys. That is actually a really clever design. I really like that. And it's, it's not stepped either. I don't know if you can see in the back there, there's actually a little cog system there. There you can see it just, just there on that other view. So it's not stepped. It's not like you have to actually go between certain different points of adjustment. You can actually lock that down in any position all the way through that adjustment. So this is going from 214 millimeters at the minimum to 274 millimeter diameter from here to here, I assume that is. We're gonna leave that loose for now while we have a look at some different wheels. But yeah, that's a really clever design. I really like that. And it's certainly a lot easier, in my opinion at least, than we had with the uh, with the universal hub where, you know, I mean, you guys have seen this before. I'm not gonna pull it all apart and show you again now, but this is quite a clumsy thing to work with at times. It is clever. Like once it's all cinched down, it's all in place, it's good. But yeah, I'm, I much prefer this basic design, I think. And maybe we'll see a uh, club sport spec 
Universal Hub a little bit later on that employs a similar kind of design. Not that you necessarily even need it because this seems to tick all the same boxes that this guy does pretty much anyway other than the Xbox compatibility. So yeah, we'll see what they uh, we'll see what they bring to the table moving forward. But yeah, let's move on to mounting a couple of different wheels. Now we'll start off with the flat two wheel, I think, and then uh, we'll give a couple of the larger diameter Fnatic wheels a try and then maybe mount up my big 350 millimeter Momo rally wheel as well and see how that goes. Um, one thing that I'm a little concerned about, there is no forward to back adjustment for the uh, for the paddle shifter. So if we're using a really deep dish wheel, we might have a little bit of problem reaching with our hands to the shifters. But uh, yeah, we'll comment on that later on once we mount that wheel. Let's get the flat two mounted up and uh, see what happens. Okay, so wheel is all up and mounted. Let's talk a little bit about ergonomics here. A little bit tricky to reach these inside buttons with the flat two wheel. We'll obviously comment on that more when we're using different wheels as well, but nice and easy to reach pretty much everything else. You don't have to roll the hand around too much. Toggle switches are nice and easy. These ones in particular, very easy to reach. And look, yeah, ergonomically it lays out pretty well. Now, if I put it down on the table here, one thing that I was a little concerned about was the um, the gap between the shifters and where the hands curve around. I don't have the biggest hands in the world. There's enough clearance there for me just, if I put a glove on, let's just check that quickly as well. Yeah, still no, still no contact. So I can wrap my hand around there. But one thing I do think we need to talk about a little bit more is the feeling of the shifters because these are quite significantly different to any of the other Fnatic shifters that are on the market currently. So we actually have pretty much everything else that is currently available here in front of us now to do a bit of a comparison here because these, you know, I think some people will like the feel, some people probably won't like it quite so much. It has quite sort of a almost cushioned feeling to it when you squeeze them in. So the throw isn't massive, but the thing that's concerning me isn't so much the feel of it. It's got quite a, quite a nice tactile click to it. And it certainly doesn't feel sloppy like I've complained about with the standard shifters that come with the club sport wheels such as the Universal Hub. One thing that I've always complained about with those is that there's quite a bit of play in that before, well not play because it is spring loaded, but there's quite a bit of movement in that before it actually clicks the contact switch. So what I found is I developed this habit where I would kind of hold the shifters in a little bit before I actually click them and then end up mis mis shifting all the time. Now, depending on what kind of habits you form when you're driving will obviously determine whether that's a problem or not for you. But that was something that I never really liked about these shifters and something that really made me uh, a big advocate for, ap for um, upgrading to aftermarket magnetic paddles for these style shifters. But yeah, look, I mean, the, I think the big difference here is even if we compare with um, some other wheels as well, which we'll do in just a moment, when I pull on these shifters, it's okay in the middle, but if I pull on the top of the shifter or the bottom of the shifter, now admittedly with this particular flat two wheel, that's probably not gonna be a problem because most of the time you're gonna be pulling in the middle anyway. But if I push down on the bottom of the shifter as that is, there's quite a bit of twist there. So if you look just down in here, it's twisting almost probably I'd say two millimeters there before it's actually contacting, which does make it feel a little bit strange to push on. And if we push on the top, you can see the same kind of thing. If we push in the middle, it's perfectly fine. So if you do grab it in a strange place, it is a little bit strange. And if I kind of push on it really hard there, you can see it actually, you know, there's quite a lot of twist there. So. You know, the reason, and I, we'll comment on this once we go for a drive, whether it actually feels problematic in a, you know, in a driving scenario. But the reason why I'm calling this out now is because it does feel, you know, so significantly different from any of the other shifters that we've reviewed from Fnatic. So for example, let's have a look at the WRC wheel, which is another CSL Elite range wheel. And again, on this one, even though we've got quite large shifters and they do feel quite similar in terms of the action and the click, with the metal design of these shifters, you can see regardless of where I pull on the paddle, it's pulling in in the same way. And the area you need to pay attention to is in here. You can see there's no twist there going on at all. It's just straight in, straight out, a little, little bit there, but really not enough to be of concern. Whereas if we go back to the other one again, you can see very clearly the amount of twist that's going on. And again, like if we look at the, um, the standard club spot shift, the same deal. We can pull on that wherever we want and it's not going to twist. It's a little bit hard to tell with that, but I guarantee you when that's, when that's mounted on, the, the twist is absolutely minimal. If we have a look at the Club Sport Magnetic Paddle Module, same deal again. I can pull top or bottom 
no problem. If we go across to the McLaren V2 wheel as well, same deal. No twist there whatsoever of significance. Now, funnily enough, the closest we have in terms of flex to this is actually the podium paddle module with the original two millimeter thick carbon fiber paddles. Now they do now ship these with three millimeter thick carbon. I don't have a set of those here, unfortunately, to test for you guys. But you can see these actually do have quite a bit of twist. And that was something that quite a few people complained about to the point where um, they actually ended up revising the design and they ship them now with three millimeter carbon, which deals with that problem. But yeah, in terms of the amount of flex, it's actually closest to the podium paddle module in its original specs. So uh, yeah, look again, we'll, we'll comment on this more once we go for a drive. I don't know whether it's gonna be a problem in a driving scenario, but I did wanna draw attention to that because I know these are the kinds of things that are gonna be important to people. And um, yeah, I mean, like again, you do have to consider the price point. This is at 150 US dollars. We're obviously not expecting it to be on par with something like the uh, Club Sport magnetic paddle module, for example, which costs, I think, the same amount on its own as what this entire assembly costs. So, you know, we do need to put this in perspective, but I know that these are the kinds of things that are important to you guys. So I just wanted to draw attention to that. So that is a quick look with the flat two. We will go for a drive with this a little bit later on. That's a 270 millimeter wheel. Let's move up now to the R300 wheel and see how that feels. So that is our R300 leather wheel mounted up to the CSL Universal Hub. And I think the thing that's impressing me the most here is that it still looks really nice even with the arms slid out. You can see the nice beveled plastic in all the areas where we can see the extensions and it looks nice and intentional. It doesn't look like something that's sort of been adjusted and kind of made to fit. It looks like something that was designed to fit this way. So I've got to say big thumbs up in terms of the, uh, I guess the presentation of this product. I think it does look really, really nice on the wheel. Definitely a lot nicer than the Universal Hub did with the same wheel. I've got to, I've got to call that out because I think that's a big, thing that people didn't like about the uh, Club Sport Universal Hub is it's, it is an ugly beast. It gets the job done, admittedly, but it's not the prettiest thing to look at. This is much, much nicer. But again, I mean, obviously we are able to adjust the throw out to the appropriate positions. So no issues with reaching buttons as we didn't before and uh, we wouldn't expect anything less. So that's all fine. Exactly the same feel with the shifters. Obviously that's not gonna change. Uh, I'm not noticing any flex at all in terms of these modules themselves and how they relate to the actual center of the hub itself. I thought maybe as we move things out, we might start to get a little bit of flex up and down, but you can see there, even though we have that bit of flex in the paddles, these parts themselves are absolutely solid. There's no twisting. A little bit, like if we push on it really hard, we can make it flex, but it, it's not gonna flex when you're driving. I don't see that as being an issue at all. So that's absolutely fine. There's no more reinforcement needed in any way, shape or form in terms of the rigidity between the side arms and the centerpiece. So let's quickly test with a 320 millimeter wheel now, and then we'll throw on the 350 millimeter Momo wheel. So Porsche 320 mil wheel mounted now. We are now maxed out on the maximum throw of the adjustment here. So I think probably 320 mil is gonna be about the maximum limit that you're gonna be able to get away with with this without some sort of other modification. But again, still comfortable. I can still reach the buttons that I need to. I do need to turn my hands in a little bit more than before to reach those inside buttons. That may bother some people, but I don't really see that being a big issue. I can still reach the rocker switch, this guy and that guy and the toggle without really having to go too far. So that's fine. And uh, again, yeah, no problems with the shifters other than what we've mentioned previously everything reaches. And again, it does look really nice. I'm, I'm really impressed with how it integrates. Again, with this wheel in particular, it's actually covering the bottom of the mount as well. So it's a nice flush design. And I just think, I really do feel like they've nailed the, uh, the visual appeal of this. I think it really looks good. So anyway, we'll move up to the 350 millimeter Momo wheel next, the big deep dish wheel. I don't think that's going to work out so well though, simply because as I said, we are maxed out already on this adjustment. I don't think we're going to be able to reach the, the uh, shifters properly or the buttons with a dish wheel, but it did say that it can be used with dished wheels. Now, admittedly, this is a dished wheel already. So it really depends on how you're defining dish, I suppose. There's probably about a centimeter of dish there on this Porsche wheel. But anyway, we'll test it out just so you guys can see. And uh, yeah, cause I know some of you might be considering something like this for rally use. So we do need to cover everything. So we'll quickly get that mounted up for you and show you what that's like as well before we go for some driving.
Yeah, I don't think this is really what they had in mind when they said it works with dished wheels. But look, in terms of the distance away, I feel like a, you know, a flatter 350 mil wheel may work, but yeah, this is obviously way out of the question. You can't reach any of the buttons without taking your hand off and pushing through. So yeah, not really what we had in mind there, but I mean, I mean, when they said, when they said that it supports dished wheels, I guess what they're talking about, you can see quite clearly here, the uh, Porsche wheel has a little bit of dish on it, whereas the flat two, as the name would suggest, is literally completely flat across the center. There's no dish in that whatsoever. So let's take the 350 mil Momo wheel back off again. Uh, we should just talk about a little bit more compatibility wise in terms of aftermarket wheels just while we're here as well. We're not gonna mount these up now because they are the same diameter as wheels that we've already tested, but we do need to call attention to the fact that this does support the cutaways for most common brand uh, style wheels. So OMP and Momo are the ones that they call out. Now, if we have a look at the design of, we've actually got both of those here. We've got an OMP wheel. And if you compare that to the design of the cutaway on the Porsche wheel, you can see they are different around this area here, but because on the CSL Universal Hub, there's no buttons around the bottom, that's never gonna be a problem. So any wheel, regardless of the shape, is gonna fit on here, as long as you've got the 70 mil or 50 mil stud pattern. And just to quickly show you as well, this is another Momo wheel. So this is a Momo 300 millimeter wheel. And again, you can see it's got a different style cutaway to the other ones, but we won't have any problems with compatibility there. No problems with clearance on the top or anything like that. So let's get our, I think we might start off testing with the with the flat two driving, uh, and then we'll go straight to the 320 mil. I don't think we really need to do any driving with the R300 because you know somewhere between the two is gonna be pretty self-explanatory. But we'll see if there's anything remarkable, we'll comment on it when we go for a drive. All right, so over on the PC now, we've got a CSL Elite wheelbase set up here for some testing. Now, what I wanted to do first before we go for a drive is just spend a little bit more time talking about the quick releases. We've got one of the new quick release adapters here off a wheel, as well as the metal quick release that I showed you briefly before in the video. Now, one thing that I did want to highlight in a little bit more detail for you, as you can see on the plastic quick release here, we've got this little plastic knob. Now, what this does is it activates a little tiny switch inside the wheel itself to tell the wheelbase that it's a CSL Elite hub that's uh, or quick release that's mounted to it. So you can see on the metal one, no such thing. So basically when that switch is uh, deactivated, so when it's not being pushed by the little prong, that enables full torque mode on DD1s and dd 2 So no difference at all on the CSL Elite or the Club Sport wheelbase 2.5, but uh, yeah, in the case of a DD1 and DD2, if you do wanna unlock the full torque potential of the wheel, you will need to purchase the quick release, which is an extra 99.95 US dollars or euros. So just keep that in mind, but I just wanted to mention that quickly. Now there are a couple of other differences, obviously in the design, which we talked about earlier, but also in the way they uh, they flex around on the wheelbase too. So we'll have a quick look at that too. What I'll do is I'll slip on the wheel first of all. So just to show you quickly how this works, we put it all the way around to the fully released position. It's pretty foolproof. Then we tighten it down, clamp it down with this. So you can see the little line there. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna slip it on, push it all the way on, and then we just rotate the cuff around the back until it lines up with the line. And there we go, we're completely mounted. You can see the displays come up, we're already functional. And that's one of the things I do love about Fnatic and their ecosystem is the fact that you can just plug the wheel in and it just works straight away. You don't have to exit out of a game or anything like that. So we can see at the moment, we've got our gear selections showing up on the screen. We can also set it to speed. Now, if you wanna see more about exactly how the uh, seven segment triple digit display works on the wheel. Uh, we've got other videos which I'll link down in the description below for you guys that go through all of that in detail. But we'll just quickly show you how you access the tuning menu as well. So you push the little button here and that takes us through to our presets. We can scroll through our five different presets for different wheels or different cars and you can scroll through the various different settings. So sensitivity, force feedback strength, uh, drift mode, uh, force effect intensity, and so forth all the way through. So again, look at our other videos. I'll link some of those down in the description for more information on that. But we'll jump back out of the tuning menu for now, back to our gear selection. And again, this is all configurable through uh, the Fanalab software. So you can have it show pretty much whatever you want on the display. And again, there's a video link down in the description where we went through all of that in detail too. So one of the things that we highlighted in our WRC wheel review that uses this same quick release style, as well as the McLaren GT3 review, was that there was a little bit of flex in uh, the mounting surface where the quick release itself actually bolts to the wheel. So this surface area here, rather than the flex that you get with the metal quick release, which tends to come from the sleeve itself. And I'll demonstrate 
both of those scenarios to you now. So if you have a look, I've got my WRC wheel here to give you a comparison as well. If we have a look at the flex on this wheel, there's quite a few things that are moving around. I wanted to sort of, you know, create a scenario that is more typical for what people that are running a CSL Elite wheelbase are likely to be, you know, using. So there's a little bit of movement side to side of the wheelbase on the table itself. But the majority of the flex that I'm seeing here from the base relative to the wheel is actually in the shaft of the motor itself and it wobbling around inside the housing of the case rather than the wheel itself actually flexing on the quick release. So we don't have any shaft play, so to speak, through here. And there's very little, if any, flex of the quick release actually mounting to the wheel, which is a really good sign. That's something I'm really happy to see. So let's just quickly do a bit of a comparison with a few other wheels here. We'll slide this one off and we'll slip our WRC wheel on. And we actually tested this when we did the review of this video, review of this video, the review of this wheel on, a, uh, on our DD2 on the P1X cockpit. So this will be a good little bit of extra information for you guys as well. So we'll slot this on, screw it down, exactly the same as before up to the line. And with this one, you can see there is actually a little bit of twist between the quick release itself and the face of the wheel. So just looking at it like this now, there is more flex in this wheel than there is in this CSL Elite. So if you have a look at that in more detail, it actually does have a bit of a recess in there. And that little bit of extra plastic surface where it bends around is obviously giving us a little bit more rigidity through there. So that's a really good design and I'm very happy to see that. Just, you know, subtle little things like that do make a difference. If we compare, again, against this wheel, we'll pop it off. You can see this is sort of just bolting straight into a piece of plastic. It's not, you know, it is flush surface, so there is a little bit of a step in there, but there's definitely a lot more flex in the mounting surface here than we had on the um, on the CSL Elite Universal Hub. Now let's just quickly compare that to the McLaren GT3 wheel as well, which we now have the metal quick release on. This will give us a good point of comparison there. So slot this guy on, click it into position. There we go. And with this one, you can see when I bend it from side to side, there's actually a little bit of a clicking sound. I don't know if you guys can hear that. And what that actually is, is it's the metal sleeve of the quick release itself actually moving around. There's a little bit of play in there between the sleeve and the shaft of the motor. And that's what's actually giving us the flex. So we don't have a whole lot of flex between the wheelbase and here, but there is that little bit of movement there. So the net result is essentially that the amount of flex that we have between the metal quick release and the CSL Elite wheel um, quick release is about the same, but in the case of the metal quick release, the flex is coming from the sleeve, whereas on the um, on the CSL Elite one, the flex is actually coming, you know, from the mounting surface at the back here. So, my uh, my take on that is basically, you know, for all of these wheels that are shipping with the um, CSL Elite quick releases now, unless you have a DD1 or a DD2, I don't really see a whole lot of reason to upgrade to the quick to the uh, metal quick release. I don't, even though it does reduce the flex in some areas, it kind of introduces the opportunity for play in the shaft in other areas. So it's definitely not an essential upgrade unless you're wanting to use a CSL Elite wheel that comes with this on a DD1 or a DD2 and unlock that uh, full torque mode. Now, just quickly, we should also note that full torque mode isn't available on the, uh, on the WRC wheel, even if you do switch it over to the metal quick release. So just be aware of that. But yeah, in the case of the McLaren GT3 and the new CSL Universal Hub, you do unlock the uh, full torque mode by switching over to the metal quick release. But anyway, I think that's everything we need to cover in terms of flex and play and things like that. So time to go for a drive. <laughs> I did a bunch of testing in Assetto Corso Competizione as well as F1 2020. Now, F1 2020 is a title I've spent quite a bit of time with and I do routinely sort of do button presses and things like that around the track. I change ERS maps, fuel maps, and those things. So I wanted to sort of use that to test out the ergonomics of this wheel pretty extensively. And I tested it out with the, uh, the round one wheel that you can see beside me now, as well as the flat two that you'll see in the majority of the footage. So what I found was um, using the toggle switches 
filters. So these guys here for my ERS and fuel trim work quite well. Um, there were a couple of little nuances in those switches that I'll talk about in just a moment. But in terms of reachability, it was pretty straightforward. The two larger red buttons were a little bit more tricky to reach, but I tend to sort of assign those to functions that we don't want to be pressing by accident anyway. Everything was easy to sort of feel around the wheel though. Didn't have any problems in VR either. It was all very, very comfortable. Uh, the rocker switch as well was quite nice. I actually ended up using that for brake bias and very easy to kind of feel again in VR in particular. You can kind of, you know, just feel whether you're going to the left or the right a lot easier than kind of having to find two separate buttons entirely. So I do like the addition of that and I do feel like for me at least I prefer having that rocker switch to two individual buttons. I think it works quite well. Um, now in terms of ergonomics with different size wheels, we did test out with a 320 mil driving as well as a bunch of other ones and really the, um, the driving experience with different sizes didn't really change the ergonomics of the wheel in terms of the reachability of the buttons at all because we do have that adjustment from 214 I think it was millimeters to 274 and that actually works really well. It didn't have any problems at all. Obviously once we started to get into dished wheels and wheels larger than about 320 mil we did have some problems as we expected from our earlier closer look segment but yeah look overall really really impressed with the way everything kind of looks and feels. The way it looks on the wheel as well regardless of the wheel we put on it it was very very nice. In terms of flexibility on the wheel itself as well, I didn't have any problems with that. I did do some testing with the metal quick release as well as the CSL quick release that comes with the wheel. And again, as I've said with my review of the McLaren GT3 V2 wheel as well as the WRC wheel, I really don't see any need to upgrade to the metal quick release unless you are wanting to use it on a DD1 or DD2 and unlock that full torque mode. It just didn't really feel any different to me in the heat of the moment driving. There may be subtle, slight differences in the amount of flex from side to side, but you really, at least for me, I don't notice those things when I'm driving at all. Basically, I feel like if you've got any flex in your cockpit at all, and I mean even just the tiniest little bit, you're really not gonna notice that flex through the wheel. And I really just don't see any compelling reason why you would wanna upgrade to that metal quick release other than to unlock full torque mode on the DD1 and DD2. So that's my opinion on that. Part. Uh, but look, while we are talking about flex, the one thing that I do want to talk about in particular is those shifters. I want to reflect on that again because I did have concerns when we kind of looked at it and I showed you guys in the footage just how much twist there was. Now, look, for me driving in the way I hold the wheel, as you can see in the footage, I tend to hold it and I tend to use my bottom three fingers to shift in either direction and kind of just use my finger and thumb, my index finger and thumb to wrap around the wheel. And look, I didn't really find it to be a problem for me, but Tom did do quite a bit of driving as well and it did annoy him quite quite a bit. He wasn't a massive fan of the feel of the shifters generally. Uh, he kind of has that same habit that I do of um, sort of holding the shifters at their threshold and then just pulling out that last little bit to uh, click and um, you know make the gear change happen. And he did find that took quite a bit of getting used to when he was driving with this wheel. I didn't find it quite so problematic, but I can definitely see why some people might not like that kind of cushion feel. And I would definitely say that this is definitely one of the worst feeling wheels from Fnatic that I've tested in terms of the shifter feel. I think even comparing things to the, uh, you know, the WRC wheel, for example, from Fnatic, you know, that just, it does feel a lot better and it doesn't have that flex that we talked about before. So yeah, look, in terms of driving experience, I'm for the most part, very happy with it. I think it's nice and versatile. I think if you've got a large collection of different wheels that you're wanting to use and you're wanting a cheap way to upgrade into the Fnatic ecosystem, then it is a really good, uh, really, really suitable product for that. But I think that, you know, if you're looking at just buying one wheel, they're probably probably are better and uh, more value for money options available within the Fnatic range. So I've got a couple of wheels beside me now that I wanted to sort of highlight here. And I've got a bit of a cheat sheet with me here as well with some pricing. So we've got the CSL Elite Universal Hub, which comes in at $149.95 US dollars or euros. And all of these pricings are gonna be in, that, in those currencies, just so you guys know. So $149.95 for the hub itself. Then the majority of the wheels that are available within Fnatic's range at least cost $129.95 on top of that. So the flat two wheel just for the rim on its own, the uh, round one and a couple of other options as well. They all sort of fall in at that 129.95 mark, which comes to a total of 
$79.90 uh, for a basically the hub and a rim. Obviously, there are some aftermarket options available on eBay replicas and things like that, which do come in quite a bit cheaper than that. And again, like as I would say, as I said before, if you do have a large selection of those types of wheels already, then this is a really good option for you. Uh, then if we do want to add the metal quick release on top of that as well, that's another $99.95 on top. So that takes us basically to $380 US dollars for the hub, a wheel from Fnatic, as well as the metal quick release. So bundling the CSL Universal Hub and the metal quick release together to essentially give you the same in terms of functionality, at least, to the Club Sport Universal Hub. Uh, we come in at, what have we got, 149, so basically 250 US dollars for the uh, for the CSL, and then 350 US dollars for the Club Sport Universal Hub. Now, I prefer the look of this one over the Club Sport one, but the shifters uh, are definitely better in my opinion on the Club Sport Universal Hub, particularly with the adjustment that you have. When you've got them set to their maximum amount of deflection, they do feel quite sloppy, but if you tighten them up and adjust them down to your preference, then, uh, and even the fact that they do have adjustability, plus the option to upgrade to the magnetic paddle modules from Fnatic as well, should you wish to do that, which you can't do uh, on this wheel. And I'm sure that somebody will come up with some way of coming up with an aftermarket uh, magnetic mod for this as well, but at the moment, at least at the time of making this video, that doesn't exist. So something to keep in mind. So. Yeah, look, I'd say given that we don't really need that metal quick release unless we're running on a DD1 or a DD2, I would definitely say that this is good value. Whether or not it's better value than the Club Sport Universal Hub really just comes down to what you're gonna be using it with, I think, and uh, what kind of shifters you prefer. But I can definitely see a place in the market for both, and I think that they're both good options depending on where you come in and what kind of product you're gonna be wanting to use it with. So of course, the other option that we need to take a look at in detail here is comparing to the value offered by standalone wheels that don't allow you to swap rims out on. Now, obviously we do have the advantage of you know being able to change between different rims for different driving styles, and that is imp an important advantage of a universal hub. But there are a lot of other options within the Fnatic ecosystem that I do think provide better value if you're only after one particular wheels. So I've got a couple of options here beside me now which we're going to go through. So $149.95 for the CSL Universal Hub. When you add the cost of one of Fnatic's wheels on top of that, as we discussed before, $129.95, that takes us to $279.90 and that is with the plastic quick release as well. We add another $100 on top for that. So if we compare that to say the McLaren GT3 V2 wheel, that I do have the metal quick release on at the moment, but that does come with the plastic one by default. That is $199.95, which I think is better value generally. This has a lot more functionality than the Universal Hub has with the rotary encoders. It's got the OLED display as opposed to the seven segment triple digit. It does have the nicer toggle switches with the dust jackets on those as well. Now, this is the point where I wanna discuss that a little bit further because one thing I did find when driving with the Universal Hub toggle switches, they are a little bit longer and I found that unless you hit them directly up or down, if you sort of try to push them on their side a little bit, they tend to lock up a little bit and they bend. And I did kind of get a little bit nervous a few times, particularly when I was doing sort of frantic driving, trying to correct slides and things like that, that you know, if I hit it the wrong way or particularly if I was doing something like drifting or rally and, those, and the wheels slip through my hands, it would be quite easy to break those off. Whereas I don't really see that as a concern with the McLaren wheel. This does have much shorter little knobs there and you know, you can kind of, if you hit it a little bit to the side, it, it kind of guides it into the correct place rather than sort of feeling like it's gonna snap off. So just all in all, despite this being a plastic body construction, it just feels like a nicer quality rim. We don't have the issue with flex in the shifters either. And I just think, you know, when you compare the quality that you're getting with the McLaren GT3 V2 wheel, you know, to this, this is just a much better value option. Now, admittedly, obviously, you're not gonna be wanting to use this for things like rally driving. But then if we move across, we do also have the option of the uh, CSL Elite WRC wheel too. And again, I feel like this just offers better value. And this is $199.95, so same price as the McLaren GT3 V2 wheel. And it doesn't have a lot of the functionality that the McLaren wheel does. If I was only buying one wheel for say GT3 style driving or you know formula style, I would definitely choose the McLaren over this. But if you're just after a single sort of one size fits all driving scenario, you just wanna pick up one wheel, then I, again, I feel like this is a better value option than buying the CSL Elite Universal Hub and then buying a rim on top of that. 
that because it's cheaper and uh, you know it doesn't have a pro again it doesn't have the problem of the flexi shifters these are actually quite nice they do have a kind of cushion feel to them and they definitely don't feel as nice as the magnetic ones on the McLaren GT3 rim but um, or the V2 rim I should say just to clarify that but yeah just overall it's a nicer wheel to drive with under most scenarios than this just because of that um, you know just because of that shifter feel then the other wheel that I want to highlight here as well that I think is definitely worth considering is the BMW GT2 wheel. Now, this is a wheel that has been around for quite some time, and one of the drawbacks of this wheel is that it is quite heavy, and that does bother some people driving on CSL Elite wheelbases. I never found it to be a problem on my Club Sport wheelbase 2.5, which is where I spent the majority of my time driving with this wheel, uh, but it does dampen the force feedback a little bit just due to the weight over what you get with the CSL Universal hub with uh, basically any of Fnatic's wheels on top of that. So just do consider that it is quite heavy. But again, this is a nicer feeling product in terms of the build quality overall. Metal construction on the front, it does have the uh, RPM gauge on it. it does also have the analog hat switch too which is useful uh, for looking around the car stuff like that if you're in a single screen environment where you want to be able to look to the side easily it does have the metal quick release on it as well and it does have quite nice shifters we have reviewed previously as well aftermarket magnetic modules that you can bolt onto this as well which improves the feeling even more but uh, if we look at the pricing here the uh, BMW wheel is $299.95 if you add up the cost of the CSL hub as well as a wheel that's 279 as we mentioned before you add the quick release the metal quick release on top of that again you're looking at $379 basically so almost what is that what's that $80 more expensive almost than the BMW wheel which again like I think unless you're in a scenario where you have a bunch of different wheels already and you just want the cheapest way to jump up into the Fnatic ecosystem then you know I would certainly choose this over buying the CSL Elite Universal hub and a wheel to go on top. I just think that this is better value. So yeah, look, I think if you're after one particular wheel, you're just doing one particular style of driving. Those are probably the three wheels that I would recommend over this. But again, I think if you already have a selection of aftermarket wheels that you've been using with a Thrustmaster or Logitech, or maybe even from a real life race car, and you're looking for a way to bring that equipment across into the Fnatic ecosystem, then I definitely think that it's a thumbs up for this product. So I hope that helps you guys out. Hopefully we've answered all your questions, but if you do have anything else you want to know, let us know down in the comments below. If there's any other questions regarding any other products as well, we're always happy to help you guys out with that. And if you do want to pick up this or any of the other products that you've seen in this video, we do have some links down in the description below that help us out here at the channel as well. No extra cost to you, a small commission from those sales comes towards us to helping out with the channel. We really do appreciate your support there. That's what helps us. That's basically what keeps us running these days. So thank you very much for that. But yeah, above all, I hope this video has helped you guys out. If it has, please do leave a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel as well so you don't miss future review videos. We've got a lot more racing content in the pipeline as well. So lots of things to be excited about. Thank you guys very much for watching and I'll see you again soon. Bye.